Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 191 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at electric miles. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that we're chatting with Jade Edwards from podcast sponsor ZapMap soon. She runs the Insights Department, and she'll be telling us all about the work they do with the huge amounts of data that they get from their app. Our main topic of discussion today is electric miles. As electric vehicles become more and more ubiquitous, there is the potential for these cars to have a positive impact on the landscape with regards to charging and energy management. We've already seen the government looking at using demand reduction exercises to remove the need to fire up gas and coal pica plants over the winter. That's one side of the equation. The other side is the virtual power plant aspect of this. Primarily, this means that with a million or so electric vehicles all linked up to the grid with the appropriate chargers, we're in the situation where these batteries can provide an instant power source to the grid to help smooth peaks. We discussed aspects of this when we had Claire Miller from Octopus Energy on the show. Now, obviously, with reduced peaks, we have less need to fire up coal and gas peaker plants, price of electricity is reduced, and household bills drop. All in all, that's a good thing. Now, the tech for doing this has been around for a while, although there's been a lack of joined up thinking when it comes to some of the players in the market. I'd like to welcome Arun Anand, the founder of Electric Miles the podcast. Welcome, Arun. How are you? Yeah, thank you, Gary. Thank you for having me. Uh, could you quickly introduce yourself? Tell me a little bit about your background. How did you come to the EV world? Hi, so I'm Arun Anand. I'm the founder of Electric Miles. Uh, excited to be here. Thank you, Gary. So, yeah, my background is very much in energy. I worked in energy all my life and uh, be it for a utility like British Gas or, 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 or a major gas, oil and gas player like Gazprom. And I was one of the first architect at the Hinkley Point C nuclear power station. And then I set up my own energy consultancy business. Uh, but when electric vehicles started to sort of uh, appear, you know, with Tesla and obviously <clears throat> a lot of credit goes to Elon, Elon Musk and his vision, uh, I, I got really excited that, uh, wow, this is very interesting uh, that we're going to have batteries on the wheel uh, and, uh, and, and it's actually going to change and revolutionize how, how we're going to, tr- how we're going to transport from A to B but also on how we consume, consume our energy, right? So obviously EVs are the future of the sustainable transportation. And, uh, and, 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 and that's where the idea of electric mile came in that, okay, uh, I obviously went in, bought my first electric car. I bought myself a secondhand, uh, secondhand Tesla. That's the only thing I could afford and, and started driving around and, and started seeing some of the challenges, especially around charging uh and charging at the right time and i was always like confused am i am i am i using uh am i using the right mix in terms of the energy mixes or uh and 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 also um, is my car going to be charged the next day so that range anxiety bit right so so that's why i thought wow uh, i mean obviously this is back like five years ago uh i said there wasn't an app how about delivering a technology which can automate the whole thing and, uh, and, 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 and yeah, that's how sort of, I said, okay, I'll maybe roll up my sleeves and try to do it myself. So I went into like two years of kind of R and D started testing. Uh, I, I obviously connected my, my own charger at home and into some sort of, um, uh, a tool, uh, which, which was bringing in data around when, around my preferences, my energy, my, my energy tariff. And I connected some of the national grid data, and then then I tried to execute and automate and spit out a schedule basically, which works not only for me as a driver, but could work for the grid. Uh, and then I was very excited when I was able to automate it and dispatch it to the charger. I mean, one of my charger 
manufacturer at home. I'm not going to name them, <laughs> but I, I, I was able to, I was able to sort of hack into their, 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 their system in terms of being able to connect my program to that charger. And then I got connected to, 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 to the CEO of, uh, of that manufacturer. And I, I called him and I said, Hey, I've got two news. I've got one good news and one bad news. I said, well, the, the, the bad news is, uh, uh, your security isn't great. I was able to get into your, uh, charger quite easily. But the good news is I've got a solution which can make your charger smarter and, and then you could lead the way. <laughs> and, and he was obviously excited and we met and, and, and yeah, we were able to obviously work, work in the future. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, really that's, that's how the, the journey began. And, uh, and then, and then obviously I, I kind of set up electric miles and I was able to go and start the fundraising journey. Well, I'm going to come back to fundraising a little bit because I do want to talk a little bit about how you're funded and how that's going. But explain the product, the concept of Electric Miles to me as if I was a five-year-old. What is it and what does it specifically do? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you what we do today and then I'll also explain you what we are going to do because bear in mind, this is still early days in the whole in, in, in the whole sort of transport revolution and all the EV and all the energy and the energy management bit, right? So what we currently do is if you are an EV driver, you obviously either charge at home and, 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 and obviously you charge outside. But today we, we, we focus on people who charge us at home. So we, they can basically download our app, scan that QR code on the charger. And if it's one of the charger we support, and as, as you know, there is a protocol called OCPB, which, which pretty much 70, 80% of the chargers have adopted. Uh, and then we, they'll be able to create, set up an account under 90 seconds, add the charger, add the tariff, add the car and, and be able to smart charge. Uh, so obviously today's smart charging is, is a law. Uh, UK have, is one of the first country to have made, uh, made, made mandated smart charging because they know the effect of not doing that, uh, the effect on the grid is quite severe, right? So, so, so yeah, so we, we, we are able to do that. We also have a, uh, what we also realize is that a lot of the chargers were actually not smart because the whole, whole journey, the, the, the whole uh, journey the installer needs to take was quite cumbersome. So we actually delivered a bespoke application called installer miles which is for the installer and they can help to commission it apply load management solar setting and all that and again compliant to the regulation uh and 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 obviously they can do that with the click of buttons and and can save a lot of time and hassle and make that charger smart which which obviously supports the uh su supports the, the regulation and stuff right and then we got a kind of a back office platform for support, troubleshooting, you know, you could fix the firmware and all of that. So combine all of that, Gary, what we, what we are today doing is, is kind of the, this charge management piece, right? So the smart charge is, is actually electric miles first step towards creating the business technical and the commercial capability, which is necessary to kind of deliver kind of a sustainable and affordable energy to drivers. Uh, obviously, however, I mean, so far, uh, smart charge, what we are seeing is could get commoditized and where we are really trying to uh, focus ourselves is, is the aggregation bit, right? Mm -hmm. So if we are able to smart charge and dispatch it to, to one driver, we are now growing our portfolio of users. And, and once we have is significant enough users uh, as as we are growing through, we could make a, a tremendous impact on on the aggregation on the grid side. And we are one of the first smart charging company to have secured uh, contracts with the grid. This is just to do the whole demand side response. This is with the the the, the local grid, the DSO uh, operators, and they they see the power of what we can do. Right, if we are able to then 
on 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 their instruction be able to move charging uh away from the period then then they, they win we win and they're they're happy to pay us for that okay let me jump in there because there's uh it's quite a lot to unpack um and i'm going to come back and address the dso issue in a little while but um at the moment your app supports uh, the Project EV chargers, um, and is it the EVIQ, the EVIC chargers as well? Yes, what, that's right. Good. Now, you started off your, your description there by saying that uh, we scan the QR code and it follows the OCPP standard, therefore it should map to quite a lot of the chargers. So why is it only those particular two that, that work with the app at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where uh, what we are also been seeing in the industry is uh, hardware now hardware manufacturers are essentially kind of box shifters right they want to sell as many hardware as possible so historically they've been quite quite close to that hey this is the app they want to go with uh, but what we are started starting to see carry is a is lot of these hardware manufacturers are uh, are getting more kind of app and platform agnostic, which I feel is the right way forward because end of the day, we don't want consumer to be only be using the, the app which comes with the with the charger, for example, right? It might not be the best app. So we are just starting to see that trend. So we are now actually testing and integrating with lot lot other manufacturers, lot bigger, bigger manufacturers as well. And 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 it's the matter of kind of finding that that commercial aspect, that route to market, or obviously how how we can deliver that whole charge management piece to them. So, so yeah, we we are we are uh, in testing with two or three major manufacturers, and we are also looking to sign up a couple of uh, other major manufacturers as well. So that's in the UK. We are very we we've just signed a deal with uh, uh, one of the French manufacturer and distributor as well. So so. So yeah, now I think the next six to nine months, we are going to see significant more growth into other brand of chargers, which, 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 which would be great. Now, also, uh, one more thing I want to say to you and the listener is that we, we are also have delivered uh, or extended our capability and technology to talk to the cars as well. So this is like, hey, if you have a Tesla, BMW, Jaguar, Audi, and and five other OEMs, they will be able to again download the app, uh, sign up, add that, add the car, and add the credential of that vehicle. Like for example, which 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 EV do you drive, Gary? I've got the uh, Volkswagen ID three. Okay, ID three. Yeah. So ID three. I think you got the VW Connect app, or the, basically the VW app, and whatever credential you use there, you'll be able to pass that through on our app and obviously we don't store any password and we are able to then establish a connection with the VW cloud and that means we can then control your car if the charger is compliant to us that's great if it's not then uh, uh, then we can connect to your car right uh, so in that way uh, we can uh, basically be able to deliver on smart charging so so that's coming as well in the next quarter what are the benefits to me as a user for this? How how do I save money on this? As a as as a user, right? Because obviously we we we've got smart tariffs. So people have smart tariffs where more and more EV drivers are adopting to smarter tariffs where day rate tariff, night tariff tariff. We also have the the agile time of use tariff, right? So with our app, they can we are able to automate the whole charging experience, right? Which means all they do once they set up, they come home, they plug the car in, and we automatic. They don't have to do anything. They don't even have to go to the app or set up a schedule. We can dispatch it. We can dispatch to the cheapest, uh, cheapest time of the day, right? And uh, uh, so, so, so. So there's two aspects. One is uh, the way we smart charge is on the off peak, but we can also set up. Uh, uh, we can also set up the 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 cost that uh, the, the budget, for example, that hey, they can say I don't want to spend more than five pounds. 
and then we our job is to go and find the cheapest five pound. They could also say that uh, we we only want some green energy, then we go and look for that criteria. So, so also uh, w- what one of the thing we are developing is also on uh, on the schedule side that uh, it 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 actually you don't sometimes you don't need hundred percent of the charge uh, because the average the average drive uh, anybody makes is still thirty to forty miles. But because we have this range anxiety and we think we just want to t- fully tank up our car, beat eighty percent or ninety percent. I know a lot of EV driver do hundred percent charge, but but what happens is that the the energy sits in the driveway and it depletes. So what we are also seeing, we're doing some study on that. That people are actually we are losing a lot of energy just by sitting on the driveway. And unlike the petrol or diesel car, where where it's liquidified and it stays in that tank, uh, energy or batteries, on the other hand, depletes. Uh, so we also want want to create a culture where you are charging to what you need rather than uh, rather than what you want. Uh, and 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 I feel if if we really gonna scale and if everybody in 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 our in our in our street gonna have an EV. We have to be more sustainable, and we, we we have to actually charge and kind of charge within our means. And that's something we are we are very passionate about, and we feel we feel our our, our technology will help us. So so not only will save money for drivers because they're charging what you, they really need, uh, but also helping the grid side because they can cope up with the demand much better. So are you looking purely at um, supply management side on this, so charging one way from the grid to EVs, or is there an aspect of potentially vehicle to grid, either at the moment or foreseen in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So so if you look at our vision, right, so we, we talked about the smart charge, which we're currently doing. We, we, we started doing the smart aggregate, which is really kind of aggregating uh, a lot of these EVs and then making an impact to the grid. The next aspect of our development is the smart uh, kind of discharge, which, which, which allows an EV to then power the home. And this is the whole V2X side. I think before V2G is the V2X where you're able to come home and, 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 and actually leverage the vehicle to home. Uh, which will basically position the smart aggregate as a as a peak avoidance feature within the smart charge, right? So this will enable drivers to use their EVs to power their home and avoid the peak tariff, right? And then the next and and obviously the the next destination is the is the future state of smart cell. We we reckon we as well as the industry will be sort of more ready by twenty twenty five onwards when half hourly settlements really starts kicking in when the car OEMs and the charger will be will be both capable of uh, bi-directional flow of of energy so so I think this will leverage the whole V2 V2G protocol to launch I feel the most important feature for smart charge right but if you look according to base V2G has the potential to reduce the cost of balancing the grid by two billion pound a year and 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 it could generate up to six billion a year in additional revenue for EV owners by 2030. So obviously we all get excited by V2G, but but what what we don't realize it's a journey. We we can't just get up tomorrow and hey let's do vehicle to grade or you know we we have to go through this development pathway which Electric Mars is on right where we are able to charge and then aggregate. And then do the whole V1G aspect, which is the way the first version of V2G, which is actually moving the charge uh, away from the peak, away from the period the grid wants us to, right? And 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 then naturally you'll you'll kind of progress into into V2G, which which really the ability, which which gives the ability to use EV to send power to the grid, obviously will work work together with the whole maturity of the, the virtual power plant, the VPP market, right? As well as, uh, so, so that's what the kind of the vision of Electric Mars is, right? Our core value offering becomes that we will enable people to then interact with their own energy, 
or others' energy when it suits them best or benefits them the most. Because, because it would be beyond a consumer to manage all this just by themselves. Even a, uh, uh, even a clever kind of uh, astute kind of uh, consumer like yourself, Gary, would be like, hang on, I don't have that much time to keep on monitoring the prices. I would rather want an application to do it for me. And, 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 and that's what we kind of really set, set out to do. Well, yeah, we had um, Claire Miller from uh, oh, yeah, Octopus Claire. Energy on, yeah, and she was saying exactly the same thing. You know, the the early adopters they're quite happy to go in and and fiddle around with settings and all that. But once this becomes something that's mass adopted, you really want this to be sort of leave it and let the system sort itself out. You don't want to have to go in and do a lot of physical work yourself to make sure that this is switching on at that time and it's it's off at this time and it's picking this rate rather than that rate it all has to be automatically absolutely absolutely because that because i think what what we need to understand is the the landscape of energy is changing right because ev is just the beginning and obviously it's getting a lot of uh, uh lot of attention but if you look at some other technology low cost low carbon technology like See, you've got solar panel is going through a tremendous uh, boost now uh, with a lot of uh, incentive now. Uh, we got home batteries, which will be a, a, a near future, a kind of a, a near term possibility where lot, lots of lots and houses are going to have home batteries. And, and then the heat pump and the next pet project is decarbonization of, of our heat. And so our, our houses and our businesses are going to get bombarded with so much technology, uh, energy technology, which will need orchestration, right? Because at the end of the day, all the energy, you're, you're kind of decommissioning fossil fuel, uh, you're already decommissioning fossil fuel electricity generators, but we're also now with the, the ban of ICE vehicle more and more regulation around smart, smart, smart appliances, which, but all that energy is going to come from, from electricity. And, and like I said, electricity is still uh, a very complex uh, commodity because you can't store it very cheaply. So that's where the whole demand management and supply management is so fundamental. And if you look at national grid, future energy, uh, the uh, the future energy crisis, uh, criteria, uh, they have quoted that twenty percent of the energy will come from the people. So where they, the which means that by demand response services, this is very exciting because we are trying to democratize energy here, right? The whole energy management is getting democratized, which means we'll be able to. Uh, uh, the power goes back to the people to make that decision. Yeah, I like that. And that brings me nicely back onto something that you mentioned earlier and I'm now looping back to, which is the DSOs aspect. Now, you mentioned yeah. that um, you're working with the DSOs to help uh, them in their um, their efforts. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that for me, please? Yeah, sure. So, obviously, Nash, just, just a little bit of background on this for, you, for, you, for our listeners is... Uh, is electric UK electricity grid is made up of national grid, which is kind of the godfather, which sits on top, and then it has uh, obviously appointed sort of uh, six DSO to cover the whole Great Britain, uh, and uh, which kind of are responsible to manage their own local demand. So they obviously then the DSO is split up by substations. And stuff and 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 what what DSOs uh, have been uh, given the power by the national grid, and I think that that big change, which came in few years few years back when you know national grid was split up into the ESO and the DSO, uh, was to give them the power to manage their own load, uh, and also incentivize their users to who would help them manage the load. But then the lot of the DSO, well, a lot of aggregation previously used to happen at a national grid level. Now the new market has opened up where where aggregation is being accepted for for 
for lower or for, for smaller assets like EVs uh, and like solar can participate in demand side response market. Uh, so this has been exciting and, and players like Western Power Distribution uh, and UK Power Network have been forefront of uh, some really innovative products they've launched because they removed one of the barriers towards entry, which is previously it used to be like one meg megawatt. So any aggregator who wants to participate, you need one megawatt. Now, in a car perspective, that's uh, if you, I mean, that's almost like 200 or 250 50 vehicles or chargers all participating at the same time in a given uh, substation. Now, tomorrow might be easy, but today it's going to be harder uh, to find that level of participation, engagement, and penetration. So what DSO have very smartly done is that they said, you know what, I'll remove the minimum criteria. Okay, all I need is a 10 kilowatt, which is just really two cars or two EVs, uh, two chargers participating in a given substation. So, so yes, it's a bit of a postcode lottery where you still need assets in the right postcode. But I think because the threshold is so low, it, 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 it kind of made a, made a lot easier to participate. So, however, I mean, it has taken time for participants like us, but also for the DSO to get ourselves ready in terms of the, 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 in terms of the whole uh, technology piece and the APIs and, and the communication layer. But yeah, well, but I'm, I'm, uh, with, with, we've been working very hard for the whole last year to build this EM Markflex platform, you know, which will really leverage uh, and, and not only use our chargers or our users, we are, we, we, we've now delivered a product where it can even use a third party assets. So late, I think late in December, we did a, we signed a contract with Ampeco, one of the, the, one of the leading kind of uh, platform for the CPO network. Obviously they're originally from Bulgaria and I know the, the senior ex executive team really well. And uh, they wanted to participate on this exciting opportunity. They were not, they obviously it's not in their roadmap to build it. So we said, Hey, we, okay. Obviously they already have their app, their, their, their platform. We were not here to sell that. We said, okay, just let's just do it through API, which means all their charges and to their platform will be able to participate just via an API. And, and that's how we can scale because if we just do it through our app, we, we would need everybody to be using our app. And I didn't want to personally restrict ourselves. So we took that strategic decision that, hey, we'll, some, we'll build some APIs as well, which means we can, uh, we can really scale this. At the end of the day, it's about delivering the volume to the DSO to make a material impact. So we got about 30 megawatts and counting <laughs> contracts with these DSO. And, uh, and yeah, in the next few, few months, we are uh, hopefully going to make more and more progress towards, towards delivering them. Let me play devil's advocate here. Uh, so I'm going to ask what might be an uncomfortable question. I yeah. look at your website at the moment and you've got a section there which talks about the app for EV drivers. You've then got the section there which talks about the EV ecosystem and you're talking about charging manufacturers, installers, fleets, DSOs, etc. Is there a, um, a possibility that you're trying to do too much at once? And you might end up not doing any of them particularly well. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's a fair question. I mean, some I think our investors sometimes ask us that, but I think smart charging is commoditized, right? I mean, for us as a business to stand out, just doing smart charging uh, will be hard, right? And as a startup, we have to be looking to disrupt the place, right? I mean, we are, we are here to. We are, here to, we are here to shake things up and, and, and really challenge, be the underdog. Uh, so, so again, and, and any, any com startup company to be successful is like what they bring to the table, right? And one of the expertise 
is the founding team, you know, myself and, and my other senior management, they all come from energy background and, and, and flexibility and the whole, uh, the, the, the DSO, the national grid angle is our strength, right? And, and that's one of the big problems as well. Like I said, national grid, we'll have to spend six billion pound if, if we don't find a way out by the whole demand side participation. So, uh, so, so I don't think doing flexibility is any different than smart charging, right? It, it's kind of the second version. It's smart charging 2.0 because first you manage your charge at home which works for you in terms of your tariff, your cost is reduced. But the next, but again, it's, it's about the whole community. It's about the ecosystem. If you want to protect the ecosystem, then that charging session should not only work for the driver, but it should work for the ecosystem, right? That because we are talking about today, it's okay, not a problem because we are still uh, at about three to four percent EV penetration, but if we if we believe in in this uh, revolution that uh, that that every street and every driveway is going to have an EV parked up in the in the driveway or on the street or in businesses and fleets, if everybody starts charging at the same time now at the moment. Uh, most smart tariff, the cheap tariff starts from 12, 1230 or one o'clock, right? Now, if everybody starts charging Gary at one, we're going to create a new peak. So one o'clock will no longer can be the, the cheapest time because, uh, because, hey, uh, that means natural grid and we'll have to get more and more generators running at that time, which is generally ex supposed to be a low demand time, right? Because people are sleeping some people are <laughs> uh, uh, most people are sleeping so 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 what we believe is sort of more dynamic way of more, more dynamic way of managing this and again that can only be done if you're if you're listening to the grid as well if you're just doing charging without be, be being oblivious of what's happening at the grid, there's no way you can marry them too, and 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 obviously you end up you end up with a solution which can is is great today, but it's not for tomorrow. And we are Electric Mars is about building the future of energy management for tomorrow. Right. Well, that then brings me on to sort of the sixty four million dollar question, which is, what's your business model? How are you making money out of this? Yeah. So today. We are, we are B2B to C. So we sell uh, this whole charge management piece to the manufacturers, the resellers, uh, and also we starting to approach a lot of leasing companies and CPOs as well, charge point operators. And, and they pay a fee to use our, our, our charge management, which comes with the Obviously, you've got the driver's app, there's the installer app, there's the whole admin functionality for support and troubleshooting. So we are taking, we are solving a lot of the problem which will stop their growth because we take care of, of the driver's need, installer needs and support needs and all of that, right? So, so, so partnering with us will help you if you are a manufacturer listening to this, or a CPO listening to this, that hey, we will help you to scale your business uh, because you you want to be just focused on box shifting, while while the charge man take care of the rest, right? And and then we are uh, so that's one side of the market. The other side of the market is the whole grid grid play where we got contracts with the grid, and we are in the business of revenue generation. So we say that hey. You add more and more charges onto the platform, we'll be able to spit out more and more revenue opportunity, be it with the local grid of, of, of dispatching on a contract, or be it with national grid participating in, in the winter trial, uh, which, you know, which, uh, is, is, which we, which we had this winter, uh, and also, and then there's some premium services we offer, right? So, 
And again, this is still early days, but one opportunity is the carbon credit, you know, with, with, if we are able to influence and move more and more charging during to a low carbon period, then there is opportunity to monetize that. So, and we've partnered with uh, uh, some energy companies to, to, to kind of, uh, to extract some of that value. So that's on one side. And then, then, then we are also looking at some uh, charge away function and where we are able to, uh, if you are charging at home, we are building some features where, hey, you'll be able to charge outside as well. With, and with the CPO network and connectivity we have, uh, we, we, because charging for an EV driver, one of the things they complain about is just having too many apps and too much tech. They just want a really simple, easy experience where they can use our app, not only when they're home, but when they're outside. Uh, and if you're able to keep all the transaction history in one place, then it becomes easier for all the expense side as well. You know, if you're a business, you want to expense it. Uh, so, so yeah, so money with, with the B2B side, so we are also extending our capability to look at uh, multi-dwelling or multi uh, kind of apartment blocks and some of the commercial aspect of the business, uh, which means again, they will pay us for using the, our, uh, the whole charge management piece. And then we, with, with aggregation, we'll be able to monetize on that with the grid and with the premium services. So that's how, that's how we make money today. Okay. That's fine. So. Given that you're not doing a lot of that to a great extent at the moment, because it's still early days, how are you being funded currently? Yeah, so, hey, obviously, uh, I mean, we would, I would love to build a business as a founder, which is breaking even <laughs> quite immediately, right? But the reality is uh, uh, this business is 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 a tech business which where we are focused on building some really core core IP which we have built, right? And we've got a couple of patent pending uh, where we reckon uh, with more and more adoption of EVs, it will make, it will disrupt and, and really bring value, right? So, so we've been very focused on the tech and then the market and that will give us the users and last is the revenue. Because I think a lot of tech startup will fail if they just chase revenue too early, uh, which because because that's just uh, because you're you're trying to innovate in a space. You're not trying to here to sell sell Apple and buy an Apple from wholesaler and may add your thirty percent margin and sell it in the market. Right? It's not that traditional business. You're 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 building tech, which is unique, distinct, and it's for the future. Uh, obviously, we still need to grow. I mean, we have a, we have a team of twenty at the moment, so we still need to, you know, <laughs> pay their salary, and then we have cost, and we've got tech cost, we got platform cost. We get together for Christmas, so all of that. Then, obviously, the deficit needs to be needs to be covered by investment. So we've been very lucky. We we had some great investors who believed in me, my, in me being a founder of my vision, but also the team's capability and, and, and what we are, what we are out there to do. Right. So, so we were, we, we raised about two, three rounds of funding already. And, you know, our last, our last round was a seed round. We raised close to a million pound. We have some industry angels like the founder of U-Switch. Uh, but also some uh, some 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 industrial some sort of uh, institutional VCs as well, like Blue Lake Blue Lake Capital and uh, Low Carbon Innovation Fund. And uh, so yeah, we we are we are actually looking to raise. We are middle of a raise again. You know, we're trying to do a, a bridge round before our pre Series A. And uh, and then and yeah, with with. The business strengthening with more contracts and more users and more uh, uh, kind of more talent we found in the team. I think uh, 
I think the investors obviously invest on clarity of the vision and the pathway and the, the pathway which gets cleared up by the team towards towards uh, towards a, a growth which is not only sustainable, which will actually become profitable. So we reckon we will be profitable in 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 the next sort of eighteen months to two years. But, uh, but yeah, at the moment it's about the grind. It's about can the team continue on and keep having these small wins and have some major wins in the middle, like the French contract we signed, and and that should instill confidence in the investors and uh, and yeah that that's a really key part key part of my role and uh in order to make sure the funding keeps coming in well that seems like an appropriate point to uh draw this discussion till close uh Aaron Anand, thank you very much for your time thank you gary uh, i really enjoyed <laughs> the questioning and yeah looking forward uh hopefully see you face to face one day a couple of takeaways from this Electric Miles is one example of a growing number of developers who are taking control of both sides of the charging experience, the vehicle side and the charger side. With that control, they're able to manage how and when power is passed into and out of car batteries. This has financial benefits to the user, as well as benefits to the grid and that it can manage demand and ensure greener energy is being used. The company is still very much a startup and is looking to get funding to grow. I think they have potential for helping to manage the grid. Let's hope they can make it work. My thanks to Aaron for his time. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. Pioneering luxury off-grid travel trailer company Living Vehicle released its newest HD4 model sorry, its newest HD24 model recently. The new all-electric trailer boasts the same advanced features like an all-solar roof and capabilities as its flagship model, only in a smaller package. The all-electric HD24 luxury trailer comes fully loaded with the same 72 kilowatt hour energy system and an all-solar roof. The travel trailer harnesses the power of the sun to run high-end appliances, off-grid air conditioning and more. With features like a lounge area that converts to a queen bed, shower, 13 cubic foot solar refrigerator, 42 inch 4K TV, dishwasher, cooktop, movable kitchen island, 8 foot outside patio and more, the HD24 is quite spectacular and has a price tag to match. The HD24 will be in limited production in 2024 starting at $299,995. I can dream, right? The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got me electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've got renewable. It's also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musing TV with the words, I can see for miles and miles. Hashtag, if you know, you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know he's out on his unicycle and he can ride for miles at a time and usually until the battery runs out. But the range issue he has 
isn't actually related to his batteries, it's his own stamina. He gets tired quite easily and he needs his electrolytes replenished. Back in the day, when we bought the Lucasade, it'd be off again. But with Red Bull, Monster, Gatorade and all the other drinks to help him stay on top of his game, it's a much more confusing time. What we need to understand is the, the landscape of energy is changing, right? Thanks for listening. Bye.